This is not just any abandoned quarry. When you walk the trails, there's a comforting sense of nature surrounding you like a hug. Birds chirping, mushrooms growing in wet leaves, moss and lichen taking over boulders, a diverse array of trees. All of this coexisting with the contrasting remnants of a mysterious industrial past. Shockingly large chunks of pink rock chaotically strewn about as if ripped out of the ground by an angry giant toddler. Blocks with chisel marks and cliffs with metal rods stuck in them as if abandoned in the middle of a workday. Making one wonder, what happened here? Where was all the missing rock sent to and what structures are they now a part of? This is the rock that was used in one of the most famous monuments in the world, the Statue of Liberty. When you go to a city, you probably don't expect to learn about any sort of natural history, but what if I told you that in cities, especially New York City, you are surrounded by building stone that tells the ancient story of our planet's geologic past. Come with me as we explore the contrasting worlds of an old quarry taken over by forests, and then to the Statue of Liberty itself to see this historic stone in use, all while learning about the over 600 million years of history that Lady Liberty is standing on. This is the story of the Stony Creek Granite. driving down the road to the quarry right now to park at the trailhead and I passed two huge trucks carrying giant boulders of granite on them. So that was cool. I guess I'm going in the right direction. <laughs> I'm at the Stony Creek Quarry right now in Branford, Connecticut. I'm standing in what used to be the functioning part of the quarry but is now a forest and trail area. Um, but I'm actually going to walk on a trail that kind of like walks right up to the current in-function, in-use quarry that's still quarrying the same rock formation that was used in the Statue of Liberty over a hundred years ago. Okay, I'm literally like 10 feet into the trail and I'm already like taking so long to do anything, but I'm surrounded by really cool rocks, so what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Is this a tulip leaf? This is a tulip tree leaf. Where did it come from? Oh, look at the tulip tree. Hello. So all this pink granite rock is part of the Stony Creek granite formation. Granite is an intrusive igneous rock, meaning it formed deep inside the Earth's crust. It began its journey as molten rock, or magma, that intruded into the crust over 600 million years ago as a magma chamber feeding a line of volcanoes off the coast of ancient North America. Eventually, this island arc collided with the main continent during the Taconic Orogeny. The Stony Creek granite represents the part of that magma body that never erupted up to the surface through those ancient volcanoes. Instead, that magma stayed underground and cooled over millions of years, the minerals crystallizing into individual crystals that can be seen with the naked eye. But that's not where the story ends. See, this rock is constantly evolving and has experienced several different lives. The first life as magma cooling in the crust, and the second, a remelting event where certain parts were exposed to heat and pressure, causing them to melt and then recool. This is why you see some of those areas of extra large crystal grains called pegmatites. I already saw some really cool rock. I have to show you, come on. This chunk is a pretty fresh surface and I just looked at it and it has so many huge feldspar crystals. Um, granite is made up of essentially feldspar and quartz and this one has a lot of biotite. Um, but this looks like a pegmatitic portion of it because it has such like insanely large crystals. So this is a great example of where you can see the variation in the rock texture. You can see it goes from this, this is already pretty coarse grained, but then it gets even bigger right here. And wow, behind this leaf as well, over here. So there's huge crystals of orthoclase feldspar, which is the one that has more potassium in it. So not all feldspar is pink, but a lot of the time if you see pink in a rock, the culprit is usually this guy. 
The third life started when even more heat and pressure was put onto those rocks, squishing and squeezing and pulling it like putty to form a metamorphic rock called gneiss. That's why in many places you can see something called foliation, which is when the minerals align with each other and look like stripes in the rock. The rocks were then uplifted and exposed to the surface by erosion over many, many millennia. These rocks hold the memory of many times in our planet's distant past. They existed for the formation and the breakup of supercontinents, the evolution and extinction of thousands of species. They started to form before trees ever existed on Earth and before any animal walked on land. And now, you can hold it in your hands or walk on it while looking up at Lady Liberty. Once you finish climbing the many steps to get to the pedestal, you walk outside and you are surrounded by the Stony Creek granite. Even from afar, its pink hue is immediately noticeable, and when you get up close, you can see all the familiar crystals of quartz, feldspar, and biotite, exactly like the rocks we just saw at the quarry. It's pretty amazing being so high up, looking down at the water and the city skyline in the distance, knowing that the rocks you're standing on were once miles underground. It's even more amazing to know that these rocks were part of a magma body that once fed a chain of volcanoes off the east coast of ancient North America roughly 600 million years ago. This right here is an isosity texture, which is a metamorphic rock texture, meaning that the granite was squished and put under heat and pressure, and it made the minerals align. So there's some biotite here, these darker minerals, which are mica minerals, those are really flat, plainy. Think of like a bunch of dominoes, like falling all over each other. They align onto each other really easily because they're flat and plainy. Okay, this looks so incredible and it's so peaceful sounding. It just amazes me that this was thousands of feet underground and now I'm looking up at it. Okay, so right now I'm sitting in the front of a big face of granite and I'm in the quarry so I'm like in the what used to be the operating quarry so the face of granite likely it's a natural joint or like a natural fracture that the rock is already weak in that angle making it easier to break apart so it's not like this was cut by like some crazy piece of equipment in this like perfectly straight face it definitely needed to be broken and blasted by equipment, but it also has natural fractures that make it easier to break into big blocks, which is another reason why the Stony Creek granite was so sought after as use in buildings because it didn't fall apart, but it also kind of like conveniently broke apart, semi-conveniently, into big chunks. There's still metal rods in the rock right there. It looks like it was just like abandoned like that. Granite quarries in Branford, Connecticut started quarrying the pink stone around 1858, with over 20 quarries open and running by the 1890s. 
The quarry I'm visiting in this video isn't the exact quarry that was commissioned for the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty, that was a quarry nearby, but it's all from the same rock formation in the same area. Stony Creek granite was quarried and sent all over the country. It has been used at Columbia University for the foundation of the Brooklyn Bridge, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and many other places in New York City, Philadelphia, Washington DC, and Boston. Construction on the Statue of Liberty's pedestal began with the six ton cornerstone on August 5th, 1884, and the entire statue's construction finished April 22nd, 1886. Quarrying this granite was hard, dangerous work, with many of the workers being immigrants from Italy, Ireland, Sweden, Finland, Scotland, Spain, and England. They worked six days a week, 10 hours a day, and were paid as little as 16 cents an hour. Many workers suffered injuries or died doing this dangerous work, and many ended up dying from silicosis, which is when the dangerous silica dust from the rocks are inhaled into the lungs. To break the rocks open, they would drive chisels by hand into fractures or drill holes and insert black powder. The black powder, when blasted, would break the rocks into convenient big blocks of the pink rock, instead of using dynamite, which would have shattered the rock into a bunch of tiny pieces. And it should be acknowledged that the Statue of Liberty, one of the very first things many immigrants saw when arriving in the US for the first time, notably the more than 12 million people who passed through Ellis Island between 1892 and 1954, was only possible because of the grueling work and sacrifices made by these immigrant quarry workers over 130 years ago. By the early 1900s, quarrying of the Stony Creek granite rapidly declined after strikes by workers and the start of World War I. This abandoned quarry was closed officially in 1918, left untouched like a snapshot back in time. Now, only one of those quarries remains, the Stony Creek Quarry in Branford. I think I'm almost to the quarry. It sounds like the noises keep getting closer and closer and closer. It'd be cool if I could see them actually like cutting a piece of granite right now. So there's still enough leaves on the trees where you can't really see super clearly through it, but here's the quarry! Look at all that granite! This quarry is used for many things today, from the restoration and repair of historic buildings that used granite from the original quarries, to new architectural projects. To quarry the rock, the newer quarry uses a mix of the old techniques like wedges, sledgehammers, and explosives mixed with the modern, like hydraulic drilling machinery and diamond-encrusted blades. I just heard the biggest bang from the quarry and it scared the crap out of me. My heart is beating so fast right now. It honestly could have just been them like dropping a piece of stone because they're so heavy. Whew, I know it's a quarry, but damn, I did not expect that. That scared me. Over 10,000 pounds were sent to Battery Park and turned into benches, walkways, and bike paths, and one of the bigger modern-day projects using the stone was the newly opened Statue of Liberty Museum that opened in May 2019. The designers wanted to use the same rock used in the pedestal to not only keep the consistent look of the warm pink color, but also for the historical meaning of using the same stone that was used in the 1880s. About 5,000 cubic feet was quarried for the museum, which apparently is is not that large of a project for them. So that's the story of how molten rock deep underground millions of years ago eventually became the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. It's one of my favorite things to learn about and to share these stories connecting our planet's distant geologic past with buildings and structures that so many of us are familiar with. I hope this makes you think and that now you'll wonder about the other buildings and walkways and monuments in your daily life and what stories they might hold.